Hey humans, how's it going? Susan Ruth here. Thanks for listening to another episode of Hey Human Podcast. This is episode 324, and I had a conversation with Autumn Roosh. Autumn is a filmmaker, and she's currently working on a documentary called Stop, Drop, and Roll. It documents the death of her aunt and the burning of her father during a family cookout and how her family is the origin story of the phrase nearly all of us have heard all over the world, stop, drop, and roll. We talk about guilt and grief and generational trauma on this episode, and I highly recommend watching the documentary trailer. You can find it on Hey Human Podcast links page or on the Stop, Drop, and Roll film dot com website if you'd like to check out other episodes that are around today's topic check out all the way to the beginning episode two with firefighter brooks ingle and episode 166 with holly dexter both those episodes uh, deal with fire or fire safety or experiences in fires and uh, check those out for sure Looking for older episodes of Hey Human and can find them on your apps that only hold 300 at a time? Well, you can go to blurby.com slash heyhuman with Susan Ruth, and it's spelled B-L-U-B-R-R-Y. Trust me, that took me forever to figure out how to spell that. There you'll find all the episodes from the beginning. You can also just visit heyhumanpodcast.com and click episode links on either the podcast section or the humans section of the site. In other news, check out heyhumanpodcast.com for links and to learn more about my guests and the show, susanruth.com to learn more about me, and please follow Susan Ruthism and Hey Human Podcast on social media. Also, please check out my new relationship and sex show, Are We There Yet?, with sexologist and healthcare practitioner Mara Edelman. It's on YouTube, and you can find that youtube.com slash are we there yet podcast show. Thanks for listening, everyone. Be well, help each other out, be love, and please stay safe. All right, here we go. Autumn Roosh, welcome to Hey Human. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. And shout out to Terhan for introducing us. I was actually just on a call with him. He's great. Yeah, He said that you have an interesting family history. Where are you from? I was born in California, but I grew up in in Denver, Denver, Colorado. Still very connected to California. I have a lot of family here. Um, And I feel at home near the ocean, but... I, yeah, I grew up in Colorado. The ocean is the best. It is. There's something peaceful about it. I agree. Well, tell me about the interesting family history. The phrase stop, drop, and roll, the fire safety phrase, it originated from my family. I, I believe it was 1970. There's arguments between 1969 and 1970, but I think it was 1970. There was a backyard barbecue. Um, my grandfather, my grandfather, who was a rabbi, actually, my, my dad's side of the family is Jewish. Um, my grandfather was a rabbi and he was, he was barbecuing and the flame jumped into a can of kerosene and created an explosion. Uh, lit my dad on fire, lit my aunt. My dad was five years old. I lit my aunt who was eight years old on fire. And my uncle who was 10 grabbed my dad out of sheer instinct and stopped, dropped and rolled him and put the fire out. My aunt wasn't so lucky. She kept running till her whole body, uh, caught on, was, was in flames. Someone finally put her out with a blanket. They were both rushed off to the hospital. My aunt ended up passing away in the hospital about eight weeks later. So my grandma just out of, um, out of grief, and, you know, wanting to keep her daughter's name alive, started a foundation in her name called the Elisa Ann Rushburn Foundation. And they're responsible for really catapulting this phrase, stop, drop and roll, just across the nation. Um, and we found out too, like there's historians that they're, they're going on 51 years of service. And so 
there's this, they, they hired a historian and they found out that that was the first ever recorded case of stop, drop and roll. So, you know, my uncle at the time who was 10 years old, hadn't like heard this thinking like, Oh, this is what you do. He just instinctively grabbed my dad and and saved his life pretty immediately. But it hadn't even existed yet. That wasn't a thing that kids were taught in school yet or anything like, Oh, stop, drop and roll. It was just like an automatic response to seeing his little brother on fire. He just grabbed him and, you know, rolled it, rolled him down to the ground and put it out. You know, the aftermath of that was pretty messy and a lot of guilt for sure in our family. Um, that's kind of, so that's what the documentary is about. It's obviously about the, um, the origin story of stop, drop and roll, which is a pretty, pretty solid hook. I think because a lot of people know what that is. Most people, I I think kind of know, I've heard that phrase at least. So, um, and are taught it, you know, growing up. So that's, you know, that's the hook, but the, the real like meat of the story is um, generational grief and what happens when you don't deal with your grief, how it seeps into the next generation of people who then have to deal with it and how people who weren't even born when a tragedy happened can be affected by it. You know, I have a lot of people in my family that just said like they felt like they were born with guilt. And they didn't really understand why. My aunt actually, my aunt Franny, um, she was in my grandmother's stomach when all this happened. So my grandma was pregnant when she was going through this crazy tragedy. So she was born into grief. Um, and because of that, you know, there's not a lot of baby pictures of her when she was born. Um, there's just like, you know, she, she had to go in and out of hospitals because my dad, who was five years old, was getting multiple surgeries and skin grafts. And there's just uh, being a burn survivor is a constant, healing process internally and externally. It's not just like a one and done thing. It's like your whole, it can be your whole life of just like going back in and getting treatments and stuff. Especially back then, because they just didn't have the technologies that they have now. No. And that's something that's pretty incredible. Like the advancements have come a long way since the seventies, like a long, long way. Um, I actually got the, the opportunity to go to the um, American Burn Association annual meeting in Vegas and meet a lot of, you know, burn unit nurses and technicians and people who do laser treatments. And they use the placenta for like healing burns. And there's just so many different kinds of treatments now, which I thought was really, really interesting to see because, you know, it not only takes a team of people to, to emotionally heal, but it takes a big team of people to physically heal too. And so I was like, you know, I'm really interested in like the mental health aspect of all of this, but my dad wouldn't be alive without these kinds of, you know, healthcare people. So it's pretty amazing. Dr. Grossman senior was the surgeon who saved his life and did all the surgeries. And now his son, Dr. Grossman jr., has the Grossman Burn Foundation, and they he's done a lot, really amazing um, surgeries. It's cool to kind of see, like, oh, cool, he's keeping his legacy going, and like that's like his father saved my father's life, so it's cool to see. It is cool to see. <laughs> Let's dive into the idea of grief, and especially generational grief. So normally, when I do these conversations, I start with the person I'm interviewing with their backstory, where they came from and who they are, but yours is, is, it's got a twist to it. Who, what you're doing now is a direct result of these people that came before you and their story. How do you think for you growing up in your household, were you affected by this thing that happened so long before you were even born? Um, wow. Um, it's a good question. So, I mean, my dad, like one of the first things that pops in my head is like, you know, my dad has scars on his face. So it's a very um, visible thing that like he wears his scars internally and externally. First of all, when he was a kid, he got major bullied, like major bullied. And then that sat, sat in his psyche because my grandmother told him if kids were mean to you, then kick their ass. And he didn't get the proper therapy or healing. And so he has PTSD and trauma from, 
from childhood bullying and having scars on his face and losing his sister at a young age and then having to just deal with it. Um, and then, you know, then he had grew up, had kids of his own and, um, still didn't get like the, the, didn't go through the full healing process. So, you know, there was triggers for him. Um, when kids like were just like when us kids, like me and my siblings were disrespectful to him, he would lash out. It's like, he would see red, like he would like, it would, he would go black, like it would, he'd black out and he would, you know, it got like, I think that he had, like, he had a lot of anger issues that are repressed for sure. And in turn, like, I feel personally that I've gotten, gotten some anger issues that have been repressed because I feel like, uh, you know, I grew up in a, in, in an environment where it wasn't totally stable. You know, my parents got a divorce at a super young age. Um, not super young, but like young enough. I was like, I was around eight years old when they separated. So, um, so yeah, I think that, that, that affected me. No doubt is just like, just his anger, anger issues that he didn't deal with. Then, you know, recreated anger issues in his children that, they are trying to deal with now and break these like generational curses and stuff for sure. Um, yeah. The other side is that, you know, kids would ask me like, what happened to your dad's face? Um, and like being a kid, I, I for sure was embarrassed. You know, I was like, I didn't want like thinking about it now. I'm like, I think it's, you know, it's kind of an amazing story I get to tell and, my dad's a very handsome man still. Like, so I just like, I see it as like, it's almost like kind of beautiful now to me, um, especially knowing how much he's had to endure and, you know, rise, rise, you know, out of a lot of, you know, like dust to like, like ashes to like the Phoenix rising out of ashes type stuff. Like it's, it's a beautiful story to me now. So, but being a kid, you know, just kids are mean and kids ask questions and kids judge. And I remember just feeling like somewhat embarrassed by it. I got past it and it was fine, but, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Even though he was five at the time. So probably in the moment he didn't necessarily understand on an intellectual level, but probably on a emotional level, the idea that, you know, his big sister had died. That's a big burden for a little kid to carry as well, to be the survivor. Oh, for sure. Um, it actually, so I'm a camp counselor at champ camp, which is through the foundation and it's a burn camp for ages, um, five to 17. And, you know, I'd always heard the story growing up. It had always been kind of like almost like a folklore or it just was a story I told because people would be like, what happened to your dad's face? And I would have my automatic response. And I knew the story, like the back of my hand. I thought, I thought, I know I knew a very like watered down version of the story. So when I started doing this documentary and just started interviewing people in my family and finding out more things, it just started opening up to me more and more. And then I was a camp counselor. These kids get off the bus and this is a week for these kids just to be kids. Like they don't have to think about their scars or the other people that are sad for them or grief for their parents or their family. They just get to go be kids for a week. They get to zip line and, and go on water slides and horseback ride and paintball and do all the fun camp things. So they're really happy to be there. Um, so we all like the counselors all line up and wait for them all to get off the bus and they give every single one of the kids a hug. And the five-year-olds started getting off the bus and, um, I just like lost it. I was like, holy cow, that's how old my dad was. And like, they're just like babies and they're just running at you. It's so excited and hugging you and just knowing that like, they've gone through these kinds of things and that's how my dad was. I was just like, 
Like I had to like get out of the line and be like, holy cow. Like it just became so much more real to me, like so much more real. And then I asked my dad questions. I hadn't asked him before. Like, you know, like when you were getting all these surgeries, did you like freak out? Were you crying? Like what, like, what was it like? Like get getting skin grafts on your face and like, you know, that were taken from his leg that he had to like get onto his face. And like, he had to wear like this crazy contraption to school. And what was that? I was like, what was that like? And he's like, you know, I was just like, I, I just knew I had to be strong. Like I was just like weirdly strong about all the surgeries. And I was like, well, yeah, what about, I was like, I was like, what about when you found out that your sister died? Like, I was like, I was like, how did you react to that? He was like, oh, I was screaming. And I was just like, my heart just like melted, like to know that like you already have to go, like, this is supposed to be a fun day. And then you already had like, then all this crazy chaos, I'm sure it happened just so quickly. And then all of a sudden your life is just flipped. Like you have, you have, you're, you have, you know, a physical disformity like that you can see. And when you're that young, you know, that you just like, everything's different in that sense. Then you have to go back to school where kids are mean to you for this thing that happened to you. And on top of it, you lost your sister, like your best friend. She was eight years old. He followed her around like a little puppy dog. I just hurt my heart really bad. And on top of it, my uncle Ethan, who, you know, saved my dad, always felt like this lifelong guilt. Like I didn't save her. I didn't save her. And he was, he didn't, he's the one that didn't get burned and he was the oldest. So he had to become an adult at 10 years old. He never dealt with it. And I guess he never, neither of them got to go to my uh, aunt Elisa's memorial. Neither of them got to go. I don't know why, like they just didn't think they could handle it. My, my uncle was so hysterical that they had to sedate him. Mm. It hurts my heart. Cause I, I was very, very close with my uncle, Ethan, and he just actually recently, two years ago, to the date, like a couple days ago, he um, he passed away from a stroke just mm-hmm. suddenly. I'm sorry. Yeah. So it kind of adds to like the whole, you know, family grief and um, not not fully dealing with it and just adds another layer to this to the story. But I did get to have I did get a very long interview with him. So it's cool that I, that I have that now. Yeah. I'm glad you have that just in general. That's a good thing, regardless of the project. When you come from a family, a rabbi, for example, a man of God, and obviously anyone that is married to a rabbi would likely also be a a strong believer in God. And, and yeah, I'm always curious when things like this strike, these tragedies strike, especially when they hurt children. Did that alter your grandfather's faith? Do you know? Did it alter the faith of the family? A really good question. My grandma, who's still alive today, she's 85. She's um, she's a Jewish woman from Long Island. So there's a lot of like stereotypical, like <laughs> like bossy, uh, just funny. Oh, she's like a hilarious woman. She and him got a divorce. Um, like pretty, pretty shortly after all of that happened. That's not uncommon when a child dies. Yeah. He went further into the faith. I think he just got more orthodox and just put his head down and just like, I I know he felt immense, immense guilt. And I think he just kind of shut the world out. He had a lot of demons for sure, but he just kind of, I think just pushed him down and focused on being a rabbi even more. And my grandmother just was like, you know, my grandma always told me like, I got married way too young. She married him when she was 20 and um, she never wanted to get married. Her mom wanted her to marry a rabbi. My grandma is much more free spirited, wanted to just travel. Um, He, they got married and he was like, all right, we got to get furniture for our house now. And she's like, furniture, why do we need furniture? Like, I just want to, like, I just want to go see the world. She's like, I just, she's like, I just put a park bench in here. And she's still like that to this day. She's 85 and she's still like, 
I'll sleep anywhere. I'll sleep on a couch. I'll sleep in a corner. Like, I don't care. Put me up. Like, I want to go somewhere. It's like, it's crazy. Like she still has like this gypsy energy for sure. Um, but yeah, it's, it is a good question because my grandfather's brother, Larry, who's still alive, he went the opposite direction and was like, I don't believe in God anymore. So yeah, it is interesting how a tragedy can affect people of faith too, for sure. My grandma is very, my grandma's still Jew. Like she's, she's of the Jewish religion. She believes in God, but she's much more reformed and loosey goosey about it. She doesn't follow any of the rules at all. Um, she wants to start going to temple again, but like she doesn't, uh, I wouldn't, I would definitely not call her Orthodox by any means. So what about you and what about your father? So my dad converted to Christianity when I was, um, like right before I was born, actually, my mom and dad, they got married. Um, he converted to, to Christianity and, um, you know, really upset my grandfather for sure. My grandfather is not around anymore. He died when I was like in middle school. But yeah, I think that my dad grew up in. So the Jewish religion is a lot about tradition. A lot of his questions of around the, you know, just the Torah were, you know, not really answered the way he wanted them to be. It was just like, you just believe it because you do. And that's tradition. And that's how his father was a lot of the times. Like the arguments around, you know, faith were just because like, that's just what you believe. And, and the, you know, he had, my dad had a bar mitzvah and, you know, learned how to, read and write in Hebrew kind of, but like, didn't really know what he was saying. Like he, he could like say the prayers and do all the things that you're like on the outside look like, Oh, you know, like you're a good Jewish boy. But on the inside, he was like, I have no idea what any of this is. <laughs> like, I'm just saying it, you know? So, um, and I've noticed that a lot because my dad's side of the family, they're still you know, it's, there's, it's still very Jewish on my dad's side of the family. So I'll go to like bat mitzvahs and bar mitzvahs and I'll talk to them and I'll ask them why, why, you know, why do you rock back and forth when you read the Torah? Like, what does that mean? And they're like, I don't know. <laughs> they're just like, any, I'm like, all right, I'll just Google it. Like I'll figure it out. But I feel like a religion in general has a lot of that. doesn't matter which religion it is. I think a lot of people, and I think this is a, an un, unfortunate thing, that people just do it because they're told to do it instead of deep diving into why there is the ritual or why there is the conversation or why it says the thing it says. Uh, and that's a real, it's a shame to me because if you look at the idea of free will, the concept of free will, that there's almost like a, an ask being given you know, know me by knowing yourself, know me by knowing things other than me you know, go out in the world and adventure and learn. And I always thought of the Jewish, the Jewish faith, like the Jesuits were deeply entrenched in learning about what the words meant and what the rituals meant. I mean, and I think there is a lot of that for sure. I just think, you know, maybe it was just a family that, uh, that he grew up in. Um, I've definitely noticed a lot of it, you know, it's like tradition, like it's just like <laughs> with, it's just tradition, which I think is kind of amazing. Like I'm just, you know, I grew up, I grew up, you know, Christian and we, we celebrated Christmas and stuff, but we also were celebrating Hanukkah and Passover. And like, I know some Jewish prayers and I always felt like that was a really cool part of my family. Um, and now I'm more interested in it than ever, like really understanding it. Like we celebrated Passover recently and like I really kind of d did a deep dive into the meaning of it. And it was just like so much more beautiful when you really understand it. So, yeah. And so, yeah, my dad just kind of like he did a deep dive for sure. And he found Jesus and was like you know, like, I'm not going back. Like I, he just had like the kind of peace that it gave him peace. It gave him peace for sure. And he definitely went through some religious 
like doctrine and some legalistic for a while. And that's a big reason why my mom and dad got a divorce. I was raised in so many different, uh, different, I would say religions and just, you know, like, uh, like rules. Like I had just, I had just so much thrown at me telling me like, this is the truth. This is the truth. This Mm -hmm. is the truth. For me, I definitely had to figure it out on my own. I, so like I, my, my dad's side of the family is obviously Jewish. And then I grew up very, very Christian for a while until my, it, it got so legalistic and, and religious, which is like, it's funny because Jesus actually hated religion. You know, he went in to, he went into the temple and knocked tables over because of like the religious spirit people had is it was more about control and power. And that's what it was really feeling like for a while with like what I grew up in. It's just like, you know, wives must submit to their husbands and you must like, you know, it was just like the rule, rule, rule. And like, you need to be in church three times a week and you need to fall to the ground crying and screaming and, and, or else you don't have the real spirit of God. And it was just like, so it was such a turnoff for me, for sure. I think Jesus really understood the idea that show me, don't tell me, (laughs) you know, the temple of God is within, you can go into the forest to pray. You don't need these buildings. You don't need someone saying that they're the mouthpiece for God. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I I don't think it's uncommon that when people, especially when they trade one faith for another, or when they find a faith, if you will, I don't know that it's so uncommon that zealotry is far behind. I think that sometimes in the beginning, people get quite, it's like anything. It's like, I just got into running. I'm going to run 50 miles. I just got into vegan food. All I'm going to tell my friends why they should be vegans. It's all of that same thing. And you get caught up in something. Oh, for sure. And so, yeah, I think it was, um, it was unfortunate for me because I think that I, I think that the structure, I, I lacked so much structure growing up, um, just like after the divorce and like just being told what's real and what's not real. And so, I mean, fortunate and unfortunate, I got to just explore it on my own. It, it, it catapulted me into doing my own research on things. And so, you know, when my parents got divorced, my mom, my mom grew up in the religious science religion. So like, it's like science of mind and like, um, wait, like like like, Christian science, you mean it's literally called religious science. Um, it's, it's like, it's like science of mind. I'm trying to remember like the, like the founders of it. Um, it's, it's basically the, the concept is that like everybody's God and like, and, um, and just like, you know, the power of the mind and thought and very like new agey beliefs. Like, so I, you know, I was like, kind of like brought back into that too, growing up. And I was seeing like psychics and energy healers. And like, I, I had a Ouija board and a pendulum. It got kind of witchy for a second. Like, so, um, yeah, that was, that was wild. Um, and then, and then, you know, coming back to just like who Jesus is and, and like why, like just the the core concept of being a Christian and like actually following Christ versus the religious aspect of it really just kind of shifted for me. And so, yeah, now it's, it's not about religion. It's about a relationship with God and just knowing that I'm, I'm really not able to do it without God that that's just like, that's the light. That's the light for me. That's the light that's within me. And like, you can't have, you can't have light without dark. You can't have dark without light. And I just know that God is light and God is love. And Jesus is, is, is God for me. And so I stay close to that. Yeah. How did you come to decide on the documentary project? What was the catalyst for that? Well, I mean, I'm a filmmaker. So, and like the story is just so unique that I'm like, someone in the family's got to make this. Um, my sister actually 
she was the one for a while who was like, we have like, you should make like, we have to make a movie about this. And, you know, she had her own ideas of what she thought it should be. And I was like, yeah, like, let's, I'm going to, I'm just going to start interviewing people and just, you know, seeing where it goes. And for me, it originally started where it was like this, this hero story of my grandma, Diane, like she's a hero. It was like the Phoenix rising out of the ashes story again, where it's like, she took this horrible situation and turned it into something beautiful that saved lives, you know, the Elise Sandwich Burn Foundation. And so that's how it all started. It was just like, oh, it's so interesting. Like this fam, my family's interesting. They're interesting people. They're all very like character like people in my family. So I was like basing a, a movie off of my grandma in like in general is would be interesting because she's just a funny person also wrapping the story into it and how she's this beautiful hero and then it definitely changed for me and I don't think my grandma's a hero and I don't think she's a villain either I just I don't believe she's any of those things I believe she's just a human that was going through some really hard times and trying to figure out figure out how to get through it and so it's it's just like the raw truth of it has really come out and it's it's interesting how it's evolved. You know, I'll tell my grandma, like, hey, you know, you did this beautiful thing. Like, like you, you starting that foundation, like you saved countless lives, grandma. Like, do you understand like the gravity of the situation? Like, do you understand what you did? And she's like, that's great. I don't feel it like I did, like I did that. She's like, it's and none of that's going to bring my daughter back. So and it was just like, holy cow, you'll tell her these things she did. And she's like, that's nice. Like, it's not like she doesn't have like this overreactive, like, oh, my gosh, it's beautiful. She's just like, oh, cool. I'm glad. I'm glad that worked out. Like, <laughs> it's like I, I imagine, though, that I mean, I obviously can't speak for your grandmother and I have not suffered the the depths that she has suffered, but to to lose a child has got to be, I mean, that's just not the order of things, right? The way she is too is like, I mean, it makes sense. It's frustrating at times because you forget when you're just hanging out with her. Cause I, I was just living with her for the past six months. We were roommates. So I forget because I, tr- it, it's like, we start bickering like we're sisters because she's like, you know, she wants to tell everyone how they should be living their lives. Um, she's, it's, she's always been like that. So, um, but it, it makes sense to the degree where she's like, she just, she doesn't want to lose anybody else. She's suffered more than anyone that I personally know. She's lost. She lost her, her daughter. I found out that she gave birth to a stillborn, which I was like, Oh, like that she's casually brought it up one day. She's like talking about her children and she's like, Oh, well, and then there's this child. I, I should count this child. And I was like, like what? Like, I didn't even know that happened. Grandma. She's like, Oh yeah, I've suffered a lot. Like kind of laughs about it and walks away. And you're just like, like the, it's, she's one of the trippiest people ever to like, in that sense, like the way that she can kind of like move, just continue moving forward. She lost her son of a stroke in 2020. Um, and now my dad actually has cancer. My, he's doing okay. He has, he had colon cancer. Um, he's going through, you know, he's on the tail end. He's going through radiation right now um, for another, for another month or so. Um, and then it sh- he should be, you know, coming out of all of this. He's healed amazingly thank god he's like his his tumor has shrunk a considerable amount but with that being said my grandma is like you know the other night she was like she was so upset because you know she's also she also lost her sister in a car accident um <laughs> she lost her mother to radiation um because her mother had cancer and they over radiated her and it ended up killing her oh my god yeah so she's like when you meet her you wouldn't expect that she's gone through this kind of thing she sounds like a living job yeah yeah for real 
it's like just one thing after the other, I feel like has been her life, but you know, um, she's had a beautiful times too. And she's had, you know, I, I don't want to paint her life as just like this dark story. Cause I don't even think she would do that, but just like hearing some of the stuff that she suffered through it, it's a lot. So, you know, the other night she comes to me and she goes, uh, I'm coming to LA with you. And I'm like, well, I don't have room in my car, grandma. Like I I have my dog right here. I, my car is literally packed to the brim. I was like, I, I I don't have room in my car. And she's like, she's like, I'll take a taxi or I'll I'll take a train. I'm going to LA with you. And I'm like, what's going on? Like, come sit by me. What's going on? And she's like, your dad's tumor is gone. They can't find his tumor. She's like, why are they radiating him still? Like, why do they have to radiate him still? And like, you know, I, like, I guess the answer to that question is so that it doesn't come back because, you know, there could still be smaller cancer cells and that's a cancer that has um, a history of coming back. So, um, but, and technology has advanced a lot since her mother got radiation. They can like pinpoint a specific spot, but she's like, she's of the mindset where she's like, they're going, they're going to poison all of his good cells. And she's, and she woke my dad up in the middle of the night and was like, you like, you're done getting this. You're like, you're not going to get it anymore or else I'm leaving and I'm never coming back. They'll go through just like sets of this with her where she's just like, needs to tell him how to, how, what to do. Because first of all, she went with, she went through the healing process with him as a kid when he was getting, you know, all these surgeries and she's like, he heals quick. Like, why aren't any of these doctors talking to me about it? Like, I know my son. (laughs) So, um, and she was like, you know, I'm going to leave then. And she's like, because she's like, because this is going to kill him. And she's like, and do you want to watch it kill him? And I was like, grandma, it's not going to do that. And she's like, she's like, I'd rather him never talk to me again. I'd rather be the villain. I'd rather him think that I'm a horrible person and him never talk to me again, as long as I know he's alive. She's like, I don't care. And like, that's where she's at. Like, she does not care what people think of her. She does not care how people paint her in her head. She doesn't care to have, to have an accolade or an award or to be honored for all the things that she's done. She's like, I don't care. She's like, I just, at this point, she's, she's still working on another foundation that she's created, but it's, it's not about like the recognition. It's about just doing it and keeping people, keeping her family alive. And she's like, that's why I'm here. It's why I got to stick around. I have a lot more people to help. And if, and I need my family to be okay. Is she still on the East coast? She's a cat. She's an LA lady. She's been in California for quite some time. Um, they moved the, the accident happened in California. Um, she's from, she's from New York, but she's been in California more longer than she, than she's been in New York. It's funny though. She still has an accent from New York where it's like, yeah, just like, <laughs> I guess it like happened in her very formative years. So it's like, she still kept it all this time. Yeah, no, she lives up near my dad in, in Pismo beach right now. Okay. So, Yeah. How is all of this unearthing of people's emotions and stories changed you and your identity and how you see yourself in the world? Yeah, I think that it makes a lot of sense to me in a lot of ways because I've gone through my own um, mental health issues for sure um, that I think are just, you know, really related to uh, like a lot of them could be situational and just like the, the constant changing is uh, like growing up as a kid and not having the stability and yada, yada. But, um, just like talking to my family about, um, this guilt that we carry and, and it's not just me and I'm not alone. And like, like my little cousins, my aunt Franny, who was the one my grandma was pregnant with during that tragedy. She has kids of her own. My little cousins, she has a little boy and two girls and one just turned 18 and one's 15 and the little boy's eight. And talking to the, the, the girls, they were like, cause I was interviewing my, my aunt and I was like, you know, this family has a lot of guilt. And I was like, I felt 
I feel like I was just born guilty. Like I would tell on myself when I was like four years old, I was just like constantly, I would say like a bad word and be like, I said this word. And then I would, I would be constantly telling on myself. Like, I don't know where it stemmed from, but it was just constant guilt, guilt, guilt. And I, i still have it. And like, I'm, I'm, I've healed in a lot of ways and I've understood it more. And like, I'm like, I have a lot more grace on myself than I used to, but my cousins were like, I have the same thing. Like, I don't know where that came from. And so it's like, it's interesting to me because I feel like I'm un, I'm like unwrapping a lot of just generational crap. That's just like coming out through all these interviews and um, just like understanding this family a lot more has put in perspective for me, like why I might have a certain trigger or certain emotions that come up. And me and my dad are a lot of, a lot of like, like, um, just like emotionally. So it's, um, it's, this project has really kind of, um, helped me just recognize why, you know, why I have a lot of these little things in me. And, um, it's, it's, opened up, um, ground for, for conversation for sure in the family a little bit more. So I'm grateful for that. Like, I'm hoping like once the project's complete that, that there'll be more conversation that comes from it. Yeah. Yeah. And who's to say it won't open up other families and their stuff too. And that's sort of the point. Yeah. I definitely believe in generational trauma and generational grief and pain and, Having your aunt be in your grandmother's belly while she's experiencing this intense thing, there's no doubt in my mind that that would go into her DNA. Oh, for sure. She's honestly one of the most interesting people ever because my grandma is not very like, uh, she calls it demonstrative. She'll say, I'm not very demonstrative. Like, Like she doesn't like a lot of affection but my aunt is the exact opposite it's like she went in the complete opposite direction and she's like the most huggy lovey touchy like wants everyone to be happy it feels like you know I was wasn't able to like like she felt like she had to be the replacement for her sister that that she never got to meet it's like she was her sister died and then she was born the youngest oh. child syndrome of, of having to keep the family happy. Oh, for sure. She has that like to the 10th degree. It's crazy. It's like just the amount of love that she constantly feels like she needs to deal out to people or else she's not worthy enough. It's like, mm-hmm. yeah, it's like she had to be, she had to be the joy when it's, there was. The human experience is intense. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. It's just like hearing about the the stuff this family has gone through. I'm like, holy cow. And it just, how it just lives in us. And it like lives, like, I don't know how it couldn't be passed down. You know, it's like, it's like living in, it's like a living thing in us, like our experiences, you know? So yeah, it's cool. It's like, like a Jewish family too. It's like it, like tracing it back like even further and like how my, my great, uncle like really changed the whole direction of our family by escaping the Holocaust. Yeah. It goes back. It goes back far. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. What a story. Well, I look forward to seeing the documentary and I know that your grandmother doesn't like accolades, but please tell her I'm glad that she is, you know, turning such horrific pain into something so beautiful and so helpful. And I mean, I don't understand the mysteries of the universe or God's plan, but I know that uh, it's a beautiful thing to be able to somehow reshape a tragedy. It may not, you know, you may not get over it, obviously, and you can't, how do you get over losing a child? But to be able to bring hope and joy to so many people. Oh, yeah. Well, now her new foundation is called her new foundation. She's been working on it for 20 plus years, but it's called Let's Play Hollywood Foundation. And it's an after school program that teaches kids how to make movies. That's that's her goal. She wants she wants to find kids who are mostly just like in in danger of dropping out and like lost hope and, you know, give them like the magic of Hollywood. (laughs) I love that. I know some people that might be interested in that, that are in the business here that would probably really love that. 
oh, for sure. She would, I, she would absolutely love some connections. I yeah. Know she, yeah. I'll, I'll send you some names. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When, when will the documentary be out or do you have a, an idea? Do you know what it's called yet? Any of that sort of thing? It's called Stop, Drop and Roll. The, um, we have a website, stop, drop and roll film.com. There's a, um, there's a trailer. So I am working with purple magnet productions. It's my friend's production company. Um, uh, Lauren Musgrove is the co-director. She's won eight Emmys for documentary filmmaking. And so I'm really blessed, lucky to be working with her. Maggie Brown is producing it. Um, she's worked with Jared Leto and America's Got Talent. She's produced a lot of major things. So I'm, yeah, I'm excited. So basically they took my like years, Lauren took my like years of interviews and turned it into a trailer. We are in the process of funding our film. It's connected to a nonprofit called From the Heart, which is basically a foundation that helps films like this kind of get made. Um, and people can donate on like a tax deductible basis, um, which is really cool. We're just working on funding right now. I mean, we've we've gotten some money and we have been able to um, do some more interviews. Like we've gotten we've gotten a good amount of footage. We're kind of in the funding process. And then once that happens, I have to kind of narrow down uh, everything into a 90 minute film. I have so much story to tell. Um, I'm really, really interested in in like the science behind generational grief and like what they call epigenetics, how um, just like literally our DNA can change based off of stuff that we go through and how it and how it gets passed down to the next generation of people. It's like there's a real science behind it. So talking to experts, in the in those fields um and specialists and stuff would be something i would be really interested in but also just you know narrowing it down to so it's like it gets the message across and like what like i'm still trying to kind of figure out the conclusion of it right like i i have all this like oh healing and and generational grief and the through line of my family and stop drop and roll and all of this but it's like how does it conclude I'm not totally sure. Like, what is the, what's the end goal? Like, you know, everyone heals differently. Everyone walks through this differently. So like, I want there to be hope at the end. Like that's, that's my, my biggest, my biggest goal is to, to give some people hope. I don't want it just people to walk away feeling like, oh, that's sad. Or <laughs> like, I don't know, you know, like I want there to be, I want there to be a, like a definitive message. And I think I'm still trying to find that. Yeah. All right. Can people donate outside of within the industry? Just regular yeah. folks checking it out. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So um, if you just go on our website, stop drop and roll film.com, there's a donation tab and there's a right. couple different couple different ways that you can choose to donate. So um I'll put links on heyhumanpodcast.com. There's a links page with all the information from each episode. So I'll stick it on there so people can find you. Do you have social yeah. media that people can follow? Yeah, my I mean I have an Instagram. It's Autumn Rose Roosh. Um is my Instagram. That's really like I mean, I'm I'm really not on a whole lot of other stuff. So Autumn yeah, Rose Roosh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll put a link for that too. Okay. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you so much, Autumn. I really appreciate it. I know you're mid-travel and you're trying to get so much done. So I appreciate that you took the time to to chat. Yeah, no, I've been um I've been interested in this since ever since Turhan linked us. I'm like, you know, he's spoke only good about you. And uh Turhan's so. the best. Yeah. He's a sweetheart. Yeah, he's for sure. Sweetheart. Thank you, Autumn. I wish you safe travels. Please keep me updated. Yeah. And uh, maybe we can have you on again when the film is is ready to come out and we can talk about it in sort of the process of where you get to from where you are. Yeah, I would yeah. absolutely love it. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for listening, everybody. Yay, thank you. Bye. Bye. Rate, review, follow, subscribe to Hey Human on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks. Bye.